It's a great pleasure uh, to introduce my physics colleague and friend, Dale Van Harlingen. When I received the offer of the position I now hold at the University of Illinois in 1982, a major factor in my decision to accept it was the prospect of interacting with a stellar group of experimental physicists. That hope has not been disappointed, and of all the fruitful interactions I've had with ex experimentalists in Champaign-Urbana, perhaps the most fruitful of all uh, has been with Dale over the quarter century that we have been colleagues. So it's a real pleasure to introduce him tonight. Dale uh, took uh, his um, bachelor's degree and his doctorate, both from Ohio State University, then went uh, to an, uh, for a NATO postdoctoral year in Cambridge, and then to a uh, second postdoc at the University of California in Berkeley with John Clark. He came to the University of Illinois in 1981 as an assistant professor, was promoted to associate in 88 and full professor in 94. He's had a number of university honours. In particular, he was named Donald Bigger Willett Professor of Engineering in 2004 and was, uh, as you've heard, ele elected to the Center for Advanced Study in 2005. He's a fellow of the uh, American Physical Society, a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and of the National Academy of Sciences. And he was awarded the Buckley Prize in 1998. He's had many students. Uh, at Illinois, many of whom have gone on to make uh, themselves very successful careers in physics. And since, two, since 2006, he's been head of the Department of Physics, a role in which he's not only carried out uh, the, uh, the normal duties of a head, but uh, taken part in some very important initiatives, new initiatives, uh, in particular, one dear to my own heart, the Institute for Condensed Matter Theory, which we just inaugurated. Now, almost all of Dale's research career has been spent in the area of superconductivity. First sight, that might seem to indicate a rather narrow focus, but nothing could be further from the truth. Superconductivity is a completely novel phase of matter with properties as different or more so from those of ordinary matter as a solid is from a liquid. It poses enormous theoretical challenges and has widespread applications. One can think of many obvious examples, large-scale power transmission, medical and geophysical instrumentation, perhaps in the future quantum computation. So it's not surprising that there are many people who spent their whole careers, and fruitful careers at that, working in just, just one or two topics within this field of superconductivity. Dale, by contrast, has worked on an enormous variety of topics within this general area. In, uh, I just list them, uh, some of them, uh, it won't make perhaps a lot of sense to the non-physicists here, but just to give you an idea of his breadth. Um, he, he's worked on thermoelectric effects in superconductors, on charge imbalance, the imaging of vortices, preparation of thin films, superconducting arrays, the penetration depth of heavy fermion superconductors, specific heat of high temperature superconductors, more specifically in the area of Joseph's injunctions on quantum noise, very famous paper with uh, Clark and, Cl and Clark um, in his uh, uh, Berkeley days. Uh, one of F noise, defects, trapping, decoherence, um, high junctions of peculiar kind of Joseph's injunction, and even more specifically, um, in the case of squids, which I think he'll be telling you a little about, he's worked on macroscopic quantum tunneling and thermal activation, and uh, developed um, uh, the scanning squid microscope. In fact, I really find it uh, very difficult to think of any uh, major aspect of superconductivity in which Dale has not been involved sometime during his career. But what I'd like to do in the um, few minutes I have left is to just um, give you a little historical background on, uh, on one of the things that I, I think he'll be talking about tonight. And this is the question uh, which to those in the trade is known as order parameter symmetry. The basic ex explanation of superconductivity given by uh, Bardeen, Cooper, and Schrieffer here at uh, Illinois in 1957 uh, was based on the idea that electrons in superconductors form so-called Cooper pairs, a sort of giant dye electronic molecules. And these Cooper pairs then undergo a sort of condensation, which means that all of them have to behave in exactly the same way at the same time. Many of the properties of superconductors, in particular their infinite conductivity, can be explained in terms of the center of mass motion of these molecules as a whole. 
However, they also have an internal structure, uh, which technically is described by the magnitude and, very importantly, the sign of the relative wave function of the two electrons forming the molecule. And that's what we call the order parameter. The original pairs, which Bodin, Cooper, and Schrieffer discussed, are assumed to have the same magnitude and the same sign, no matter what direction you look at them from, or what direction they are relative to one another. So uh, this is called an isotropic state, or S-wave state. And this assumption does seem to work for all the superconductors which were actually known at the time when Bodin, Cooper, and Schrieffer did their work, and indeed up to about 1975. But already in, by 1973, Superfluid helium-3, which is a system conceptually similar to superconductors, had shown that there was the possibility of having anisotropic Cooper pairs. That is, Cooper pairs such that their internal structure looked different, both in magnitude and sign, depending on whether you're looking whether they were here relative to one another, here, here, or wherever. In 1986, a new class uh, of uh, superconductors, the so-called cuprate or high-temperature superconductors, burst on the scene. Very exciting. Experiments very soon established that the mechanism of superconductivity was likely to be the same as in old-fashioned superconductors, that is, Cooper pairing. But what was the symmetry of the order parameter? Was it isotropic, as in classic superconductors, or something more exotic? In the early days, it was generally believed to be isotropic, or S-wave. But by the early 90s, uh, both uh, theoretical work, including work here in Urbana by David Pines and his group, and experimental uh, work, including, again, work done here in Alberta by Charlie Slichter and his group, both of those had begun to suggest that it might be a rather a particular anisotropic state. The technical name for it is dx squared minus y squared. However, this, this conclusion was very strongly disputed by some prominent theorists, and there were other experiments which seemed to favor the S-wave hypothesis. So there arose what in, in those days was called the S versus D controversy. It was a very high priority to settle the question, first of all, because a verdict in either direction would rule out a large class of, of theories, and secondly, because it turned out that many of the technological applications would actually be quite sensitive to whether it, the, the order parameter symmetry was S or D. Unfortunately, the experiments at the time were all on the magnitude of the order parameter, and the advocates of both S-wave and D-wave theories uh, could tailor uh, their scenarios to fit them. So, was there a smoking gun? That is, was it possible to do an experiment which measured directly the way in which the sign of the order parameter depended on direction? That would be uh, really the, the killing uh, evidence. It turned out that such an experiment was indeed possible in principle using Joseph's injunctions. In fact, it had been suggested as a possibility in a different context but no one had actually done it. This is not surprising since, apart from anything else, it obviously was going to involve very considerable technical difficulties. You had to have a clean surface, you had to have accurate junction fabrication, you had to be able to exclude trapped flux, um, you had to do all sorts of things which we theorists would really much rather not know about. But they were very necessary to, to actually do the experiment. Indeed, even today, 15 years later, there are probably only something like uh, half a dozen labs, at most a dozen in the world, who really could do th th this kind of experiment. But Dole decided to try it. And indeed, in a, a short order, he put together a team, and they did it. And they got an unambiguous result. I won't give away his punchline by telling you what the result was, but it was quite unambiguous and definitive. Once he'd led the way, Others followed and confirmed his result, and it's now accepted as correct by the overwhelming majority of the relevant community. And it was in recognition of this work that Dale, along with our late colleague Don Ginsburg, uh, John Kirtley and Cheng Sui, were awarded the 1998 Buckley Prize. However, Dale's taste for exotic superconductors didn't stop there. Um, in more recent years, since about uh, 2000, there's burst on the scene yet another interesting exotic superconductor, so-called strontium ruthenate. And it's very exciting to a lot of people, um, in particular because of its possible potential for topological uh, quantum computing. Um, 
so Dale rapidly got uh, involved in, in that business and did some experiments, which I think he may tell you about, uh, to determine the order uh, parameter in that superconductor too. It turns out to be interestingly different. Um, so even after, uh, even over the last two years, after he became head of the physics department, Dale's research programming is very much um, alive and well and an ongoing concern. And I look forward very much to hearing him describe it tonight. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it is really a very great honor for me to give this talk, uh, uh, being asked by the Center for Advanced Study. In fact, the Center for Advanced Study has had a very big role in my career. When I was a young assistant professor here, uh, I was actually awarded a fellow. I was made a fellow of the, of the uh, Center for Advanced Study, and um, they gave me uh, time off from teaching in order to get some research going. And I guess it worked, because a few years later, I actually was made a, an associate of the Center for Advanced Study and gave me a chance to travel around and talk about the results I had obtained. And some of those are the things I'm going to talk about today. Uh, later on, when I became a professor in the center, I've started to learn uh, a lot of things are going on in the campus and to meet many people from other disciplines. And in fact, I always encourage my young faculty members to do whatever they can to become a part of the Center for Advanced Study because it's a marvelous institution and they have some of the best receptions of anywhere on campus, especially the dip strawberry, so very important. Uh, I want to thank Tony for that really way too kind introduction uh, and actually very helpful in my talk today. Uh, Tony is really important to me in many ways. Um, first of all, um, that was the first time I've ever been in introduced by a Nobel laureate, and it's a great thrill. Maybe not as great as actually getting the Nobel Prize, but actually <laughs> pretty good, I would say. Uh, and also, as you will see, Tony plays a very important point, very important role in the story I'm going to tell you today. And that is a story about superconductivity. So superconductivity, as Tony mentioned, is a phenomenon in which materials make a transition to a state of zero electrical resistance below some temperature. Now, most materials we know, when you put current through them, they develop a voltage and they dissipate heat. That's a good thing for things like heaters and toasters, but pretty much a bad thing for almost everything else. Uh, we find, in fact, that it's a horrible thing for things like electronics. You have a lot of heat dissipation. If you look at your laptop, it gets very hot. That's a real problem. Uh, we lose about 10% or more of the power generated in this country by transmitting through lines due to dissipation of heat. And it's uh, obviously a very bad thing for things like uh, the, uh, our laboratory experiments where heat dissipation is one of the biggest problems we face. So having material without electrical resistance is really a very marvelous thing. It has many applications. We use them every day. Uh, one of the biggest one is magnets, superconducting magnets used for MRI and other sorts of applications. And it also has the potential for being a very important material to uh, reduce dissipation in power transmission lines. That's also a very neat phenomenon. I've been doing this for, oh, I don't know, 30 or so years, and I still think it's a little bit weird that a material can have zero electrical resistance. So it makes for a good story, and this is the story I'm going to tell you today. Uh, it's a story about uh, the history of superconductivity and also my very small role in it to help to understand these very interesting and exciting materials. Now, like most stories, there's a lot of interesting history, a lot of remarkable characters. Uh, there's some intrigue, some controversy, some plot twists, uh, some mysteries, a lot of multiple storylines, some dead ends. And in fact, it's also a story that really doesn't have an ending, and that's also very good because it means there are plenty of sequences that can go on from this point on. And also, like many good stories, it doesn't start at the beginning, it starts before the beginning with a prologue. <laughs> and so when Bill Greenow asked me to give this talk, I was enormously flattered, and I immediately said, yes, of course I'll do it. And that seemed to be a pretty good idea at the time. But as I started to get closer to the talk, as my wife will tell you, I started to get very nervous because I didn't know how I was going to explain something which I have trouble explaining to the other scientists in my field, how to explain to you what it is that I do. And so I became a little bit nervous. And I started to realize that it's not easy being a physicist. <laughs> when I let people know I'm a physicist, which is actually not very often, uh, it usually elicits a couple of responses. The most popular is a very common, oh. <laughs> I took physics and I hated it. It was really horrible.
But almost equally often, you get the response, I have no idea what you do. What do physicists do? If you press them on this, they'll usually come up with an answer like, well, you roll toys down incline planes, <laughs> or you work in the basement of uh, the materials research lab in a very strange laboratory doing very, very strange things, or you blow stuff up, which my <laughs> colleague Paul Quiat did at the freshman convocation a, few, or a year or so ago. And in fact, I think all these things are sort of true. We actually do all of these things in part, but that's not all that physicists do. And so I tried to come up with an analogy, something to tell you what is it that physicists actually do. So I started with the premise, physics is like, okay, so my first thought was physics is like football. <laughs> I went to Ohio State University, in most years a little bit better football team, not as good a physics department as Illinois. And it's one of my great passions. So football is very complicated, it involves a lot of people. Uh, football players, football teams draw up plays, very complicated plays, and they uh, try to execute these, just like we go in the lab and draw up complicated experiments. And sometimes these plays and sometimes these experiments work brilliantly, like the one I'm going to tell you about today. But in honesty, most of the time they don't. <laughs> and things go wrong, and go very wrong. So I thought this is a nice analogy, but it's not complete. Because even though at the present time the physics department is higher rated than the football team, <laughs> we're right now ranked eighth, the football team's ranked 24th, so far no one has offered to build us luxury boxes <laughs> so that people can come and watch us do experiments. <laughs> but in fact, if anybody would like to do that, we would be happy to sell you a ticket, so uh, please come by. So then I thought, well, uh, maybe physics is like wine. One of my other great passions, wine is very complex, a uh, very interesting substance. Uh, you have to start, like in, super, in experiments, start with good samples. <laughs> There's also lots of kinds of wine, many of them here. This is actually a picture from my wine cellar. Uh, lots of wines, very complicated. Uh, and the very best ones take a long time. You have to store them, nurture them, like good experiments, good results. It takes a long time to figure out what's going on and do these experiments. And I think winemakers have also known something for a very long time that we're just starting to learn in science. They have known the very best wines come from blending together lots of different varieties. And so in many ways, what we're trying to do at the University of Illinois now with interdisciplinary research, in many ways, all these centers that we're developing the MRL, the IGB, the Institute for Condensed Matter Theory, the Physics Frontier Center we've just started. In some ways, all of these things can really be thought of as being Bordeaux blends of the very best science and the very best scholarship we have to offer on this campus. But then I really figured out the correct answer. Physics is like MapQuest, or Google Map, or whichever one of these things that you use. Because you can start at some place, here's a picture of Champaign-Urbana, and you can uh, zoom out to look at the state of Illinois or the United States, and you can zoom back in to uh, look at wine. <laughs> you can zoom back in to uh, look at the campus and to zoom in to where we are now. Here's the Spurlock Museum, not very far located from the Loomis Laboratory of Physics, the Materials Research Lab, where the experiments I'm going to tell you about were actually done. So in fact, physics is just like MapQuest. What we do in physics is we zoom. We zoom in, we zoom out, we zoom around, and what we do it, but we do it with a very, very big scale. So in MapQuest, the scale goes from sort of 10 meters to maybe 1,000 kilometers, size of the, Uni the United States or something, about five orders of magnitude. In the physics scale, we go something like 45 orders of magnitude, from the smallest things we know inside quarks all the way to the the enormous size of the universe, and everything in between. So my colleagues in astrophysics zoom out. They zoom way out to look at planets, to look at stars, to look at galaxies, clusters of galaxies, and to try to explore what's going on in black holes and other galactic objects. And they do that with lots of tools. They study the Big Bang and what happened after that with tools such as the WMAP probe and the Planck telescope. That's what we do in our department. My colleagues in high energy and nuclear physics zoom in, and they zoom way in, inside the crystals, inside atoms, inside 
uh, electrons into where quarks and other things happen, and they try to understand the fundamental particles and the fundamental po forces that make physics happen. And the really interesting thing is the smaller you look, the bigger tool you need and the more money it costs, such as <laughs> the Large Hadron Collider, which is in CERN. It's a very large accelerator ring. Here's the tube. This is one of the detectors. Uh, this is a very interesting thing because the LHC turns on in approximately six hours from now. It's actually tomorrow, but it's already tomorrow in France, and so I think at 2 o'clock this morning, the LHC will start to circulate the first beams. A very exciting time to learn about dark energy, dark matter, uh, look for the Higgs boson, very important particle, and lots of other remarkable things. In my field, condensed matter physics, we also zoom in, but not so far. We zoom into an intermediate scale on the order of microns or nanometers, which is called the world of the nanoscale. Or in fact, uh, often we like to use the term mesoscopic physics. Meso means middle. It means something which is big enough to have interactions occurring, but not so big that you wash them all out by averaging things out and by all kinds of thermal fluctuations and other problems. So we look at things like crystals and we look at devices that we make in the laboratory. This is also the world of quantum mechanics. This is where quantum mechanics was discovered. Now, of course, a few years ago, a uh, person who introduced me, Tony Leggett, gave a magnificent talk on does the quantum mechanics apply to the real world? And we actually think that quantum mechanics probably applies to everything, but certainly quantum mechanics was discovered and is most uh, evident in this nanoscale or mesoscale regime. And I wanted to bring this up because I need to borrow something from this. We all know that the world is made up largely of two different kinds of things. There are particles, like baseballs, and there are waves. They tend to be very different. You describe baseballs by velocities and positions. You describe waves by amplitudes and phases and velocity and frequencies. But in quantum mechanics, these two things blur together. One of the most important tenets of quantum mechanics is something called the wave-particle duality, which basically says that waves are particles and particles are waves. So waves are particles because if you look at things like the energy, it turns to, tends to be quantized in discrete bundles. This is where the term quantum mechanics comes from. And we give those discrete units names, like photons and phonons, and people put them on their car and drive around with license plates that say photon one and phonon one. <laughs> and those people know who they are. <laughs> so that's very important. But even more interesting, and maybe even a little bit more weird, is that particles are also waves. And Tony mentioned the term wave function. The wave function is how we mathematically describe particles. And we find that these particles actually exhibit properties we attribute only to waves, and that is interference. And this is going to be an important part of my talk today. So we all know what interference is. If you drop a couple of pebbles into a pond, you see the waves spread out. And in this intermediate part where they interact here, you see ripples that occur because sometimes the waves come together and they add. We call this superposition. The waves add and there's a peak, and right next to it the waves cancel and there's a trough. That's interference. You can see that in light very easily by putting light through, say, a, a slit, and you can get a, a diffraction pattern or an interference pattern that occurs. We call this a Fraunhofer pattern. Light through the slit will go through, interfere in such a way to give you an intensity pattern that looks something like this. If you do it through two slits, you can get a pattern which is periodic, and you can actually do this in water. This is actually water waves impinging on two holes. They're, the waves radiate out from each one. When you superimpose them, you can see there's this modulation in the pattern at the bottom, just as we've drawn here. Now, it turns out that waves interfere, but so do particles. And some very important experiments in the early 1900s indicated that when you shoot electrons or protons or baseballs at slits, they also interfere in this pattern. So this is important because the measurements I'm going to talk about today are really interference experiments. And what is actually interfering are the wave functions of the particles that make up the superconductor. OK, so with that, uh, I guess, introduction, let me start at the beginning of the story. And that is with the discovery of superconductivity. The story starts in a small town in the Netherlands called Leiden, where a guy named Heike Kamerling Onis was the first person to actually liquefy helium. Now, this is a picture of his liquefier, which is still in the uh, laboratory there. And uh, this occurred exactly 100 years ago. In fact, many of us in this department were just at a very important conference, the Low Temperature 25, 25th Low Temperature Conference. Uh, 
in which we celebrated the 100th anniversary of the liquefaction of helium. Now, this launched the field of what we call cryogenics. And this is what many of us do in the basements in our weird labs in the basements in the materials research lab. It's the, it's the realm of low temperature physics. And physicists like to go to low temperatures for really two reasons. One is to get rid of the heating, the thermal motion that tends to obscure all the interesting things that we really want to look at. The other reason, though, to go to low temperatures is sometimes really new things happen. And Kamerling Onis found the most remarkable thing of all, which is when he was studying the properties of metals as a function of temperature, he was measuring the resistance as a function of temperature, questions were, would it go down, go up, what would it do? In fact, it dropped precipitously to zero at about 4.2 Kelvin. This was the first material in which superconductivity was seen was mercury. This is remarkable. The resistance looks like it's zero. In fact, is exactly zero. It's been studied over and over and over. It's a remarkable state where the resistance disappears in this material. Now, it turns out this is not a rare phenomenon. In fact, if you look at this is a picture of the periodic table, and all the things that are colored are things that become superconductor conducting, either in their ambient pressure state or under some kind of pressure. And in addition to this, there are thousands and thousands of materials, compounds, uh, magnetic things, uh, oxides, as we'll talk about later, uh, organic materials, lots and lots of things are superconducting. And the main prescription, the thing that gives us its name, is there is zero resistance in the superconducting state. Now, things got a little bit more complicated a few years later when Walther Meyer, Meisner found that not only is the, uh, the resistance zero, but the magnetic field is expelled from the bulk of a superconductor. Now, this is what we call in physics diamagnetism. Essentially, the sample takes on a magnetism to oppose the applied field, hence canceling out the field in the middle. And this is the origin of the phenomenon that you've probably all seen, where you can levitate a magnet over a superconductor. And this shows this diamagnetic state. So it's a little bit more complicated. Superconductivity is more than just a state with zero resistance. It's a state where the magnetic field is also equal to zero. Now, as Tony mentioned, all this was explained by our colleagues John Bardeen, his postdoc Leon Cooper, and his graduate student Bob Schrieffer in a very, very famous paper in 1957. And we just celebrated in October the 50th anniversary of this paper uh, with this very uh, interesting conference called BCS at 50. It was organized by my colleague Philip Phillips. And we had about 250 scientists from around the world here, including nine Nobel laureates. It was a marvelous event to celebrate an extremely important paper, not only because it explains superconductivity, but because it actually has applications to explain all kinds of many body physics applicable for uh, things way beyond condensed matter, high energy physics, nuclear physics, lots of other fields. So what does the BCS theory talk about? It says that electrons which normally repel each other can actually attract each other if you put in atomic vibrations, which we call phonons. When that happens, the electrons, as Tony mentioned, pair into Cooper pairs. And those electrons can condense into a single quantum mechanical state described by this wave function. So there, it, it has a uh, mathematical description in terms of this wave. And there's a phase that will play a very important part in the experiments I'm going to talk about. Now, a few years ago, Gordon Bame gave a talk, the, I don't know which one this is, it's the, it's the 12th annual CAS lecture, which he talked about a very similar phenomenon that occurs in cold atoms, in which they condense into a single quantum mechanical state. This is very much like this, uh, different in detail, but sort of the same idea. The pairing allows us to condense into this uh, superconducting state. And once it does that, this condensed state can carry supercurrent without resistance and explain many of the interesting phenomena that we've seen. Now, as Tony also mentioned, in this material, the pairing is isotropic, meaning that electrons and pairs in all directions see the same thing. And I'll come back to this idea. We call that an S-wave state, uh, as, uh, as I'll come back to. So the important thing about this paper is this really defines for us what conventional means. My title was something like uh, searching for unconventional superconductors. So this defines what we mean by a conventional state, one in which you have an isotropic pairing and uh, mediation by this uh, uh, elastic uh, mechanism. OK, the next important event in the history of superconductivity is I became a graduate student at Ohio State in 1972. This was, went largely unnoticed by the superconducting community. Um, but I can assure you it was a pretty big deal for me. 
And what I found when I became a student was that superconductivity was over. It was thought to be understood. And I had people tell me, if you want to do fundamental science, you should go do something else. It's really understood. The transition temperature had creeped up from the 4.2 degrees, a little bit higher, about 23. Here's how it went up. These are some nice superconductors, lead, niobium. And the highest one was this material, niobium, uh, three germanium, about 23 degrees. And people thought, that's pretty much it. That's all we're ever going to have. And so the focus became on applications, making magnets, doing electronics. And at that time, a very important uh, discovery occurred by a person at Cambridge, Brian Josephson, so-called Josephson effect, and the companion device called a SQUID, which is an acronym for superconducting quantum interference device. And this device, these two devices, really work on the tunneling of supercurrent, or the tunneling of Cooper pairs, to form a supercurrent, a current without dissipation. So you can actually take uh, electron, or pairs from one superconductor into the other one through an insulating barrier, and a squid simply cons consists of two of these Josephson junctions in a closed ring. Now this should not be confused with the deep sea squid, but I can tell you it certainly has crossed my mind to try to get funding from biological physics by saying that I'm working on squids, uh, neurons, things of that sort. A better way to think about this is it's sort of the superconducting analog of a transistor which was, of course, invented by our colleague John Bardeen. This is demonstrated in this very beautiful stamp here with the transistor in John's picture. So a transistor, you have a device, which is a three-terminal device. You control the current through the collector with current into the base, and you can make, of course, all kinds of remarkable devices, computers, stereos, uh, microphones, amazing things. So the Josephson junction and the squid are very similar. They're three, you can think of them as three-terminal devices in which the superconducting currents in both cases, are controlled by applying magnetic flux to the circuit. If you do that in the case of the squid, you can think of this as being analogous to the two-slit interference, and you get this periodic modulation of the critical current as a function of magnetic flux. What is happening here is the superconducting wave functions are choosing which way to go, and they're interfering around this ring. You can also do it in a single slit, and then you get this diffraction pattern, single slit diffraction, the Fraunhofer pattern I also mentioned, and that occurs in a single Josephson junction. This is, the squid is an amazing instrument. It is a very sensitive detector used for lots of applications. You can use it to do, um, and the thing that makes it sensitive is this periodicity is a very small field scale. It's called the flux quantum. And it's uh, in a ring of something like a centimeter in diameter is equivalent to something like a, a millionth or so of the Earth's magnetic field. It's a very sensitive detector. It's used for geophysics, for neuromagnetism. Uh, for all kinds of MRI experiments. Uh, we use it in our laboratory as sensitive detectors. And as Tony mentioned, it actually forms the basis for a class of superconducting qubits that may be useful for quantum computing. But for us, what it really does is forms a framework for us to really study these interference effects and be able to actually tell what the symmetry of the order parameter is. So it's kind of our tool. So everything changed in superconductivity in 1986 when the discovery of these high temperature superconductors by Alex Mueller and George Bed Norris at IBM Zurich really set the world uh, into a tizzy. Uh, this is a material, lanthanum barium copper oxide, it had a TC only a little bit higher, it was about 30 Kelvin, a little bit higher than the niobium-3 germanium, but within even a few weeks, the TC had shot up precipitously up to around 150 degrees, I think under pressure is the highest temperature so far. The important line to look at here is this one. This is the liquid nitrogen line. So once you can have superconductors at liquid nitrogen, you can have, think of all kinds of applications. You can levitate magnets in front of yourself, in, you know, in, front, in your, front of your face in the laboratory, and the whole world really changed. You can't underestimate how exciting this was for physicists. Many of you have probably heard, or maybe we're at Woodstock. How many people are at Woodstock here? Anybody? I know Gary would have liked to think he was, but. Uh, <laughs> uh, Woodstock was three days long, 33 acts, and 500,000 hippies. <laughs> After the discovery of high temperature superconductor at the AP, March APS meeting in New York City, we had what is usually known as the Woodstock of physics. It was eight hours long, started I think at 7 p.m., went till three in the morning. There were 50 talks and 2,500 physicists. Pretty equivalent here, I would say. Uh, very exciting time in the history of physics. And uh, somebody at that talk, at that uh, session, everybody was trying to hear the latest and greatest results. Somebody made the comment, our lives will be changed. 
Now, I think what he really meant is there would be all these applications of high temperature superconductivity. That hasn't really turned out that way. But our lives have been changed, our meaning physicists. Because what happened was this really challenged our understanding of all of condensed matter physics. Things that were understood before, like superconductivity, now were not understood. And we realize now that we have a very, very complex system, or we have very, very complex materials that we didn't really want to look at before. It opened many new opportunities in materials research and really launched a new era for superconductivity. An amazing event in the history of science. So why is it exciting? Well, for scientists, it's new physics. For engineers, it was applications above liquid nitrogen temperatures. So what is really interesting or different about these materials? Well, first of all, they're ceramics. They're oxides. If you, if you said, what does a high temperature superconductor look like? The closest thing I can think of is a charcoal briquette. It's a black material. It's uh, an oxide, it's kind of crumbly. Um, and it's hard to believe this is going to change, revolutionize the electronics world. The TC was much higher than could be explained by conventional BCS theory. So people knew immediately something was different about these materials. They're layered materials. They're uh, enormously important low dimensional effects and strong correlations that occur because of the two dimensionality. The superconductivity occurs in the, uh, I might kick back here for a second, uh, in these copper oxygen planes. And so it's really a two dimensional phenomenon separated by some buffer layers. There's very unusual properties, and these are really what gave the clues to that this was a different kind of material. All the thermodynamics, the transport properties, electrodynamics, almost anything you measure in these materials is different. And they have an amazing doping dependence. Ordinary superconductors are pretty impervious to impurities. The quantum mechanical effects make them kind of insensitive. That's not true for these materials. And so here's a picture of what we call the phase diagram. If you start with the, the parent materials of the high temperature superconductors are really insulators. You dope them with electrons or remove electrons, what we call hole doping. You can go into all kinds of amazing and interesting phases. And we are studying pretty much all of these in the, at the University of Illinois in the Department of Physics. But I'm going to focus today just on the superconducting state and what is the exotic nature of that state. So unconventional to us means not like BCS. BCS defined conventional superconductors. And as Tony mentioned, what's really important is the pairing symmetry. The internal wave function that causes the interactions is in some ways anisotropic. OK, so let me tell you about symmetry. Symmetry is everything to a physicist. Uh, when we hang pictures on the wall, my wife's always saying, it's too symmetric. It's too symmetric. You need to, uh, so, but physicists always want to make it all symmetric. Because symmetry is an important property of physics. There's lots of books written about it. I just saw this one that came out by Leon Letterman, Nobel laureate in physics. Symmetry characterizes how systems remain unchanged and variant uh, under different changes in the system. For example, if you translate the system or rotate it, or you reverse the chirality left or right, uh, invert things, time reversal symmetry. Uh, we even define, the theorists even define superconductivity as a, as a type of broken gauge symmetry. I'm not going to get into that, but if you want to come down after the talk, I'm sure Tony would be glad to explain it to both of us. <laughs> so the kind of symmetry I'm going to talk about is pairing symmetry, or as he defined it, order parameter symmetry. So what we're really talking about is the internal wave functions of the Cooper pairs. The interactions cause the pairing. They reflect themselves in the symmetry of the pairs. And so there are lots of different kinds of symmetries. Uh, we have the isotropic one we mentioned. If you have things that are anisotropic but odd, in other words, they change depending on whether you're going up or down, we call that a P-wave parity or P-wave symmetry. Uh, the, uh, if you change directions, whether you're going left and right or up and down, that's called an, uh, an anisotropic even parity or a D-wave state. There is F-wave and lots of other things. Now, if these names look familiar, it's probably because you took chemistry at some point. And these are exactly the symmetries of the atomic orbitals and atoms. And these stand for strange things like sharp principal diffusion. And they have to do with the optical interference patterns that people observe in those materials. But for us, they characterize these wave functions. And so the trick was, or the, uh, the goal, was to figure out which of these symmetries describes these very unconventional superconductors. Now, um, one of our colleagues, Charlie Schlichter, did a lot of the work for us. Because within just a few years of the discovery of high temperature superconductors, his NMR spectroscopy told us that it could not be an odd symmetry state, 
which left us with this pairing symmetry debate really coming down to whether it was an S wave state, which is isotropic, or this D wave state, which changes sign in different directions and has these regions along these uh, 45 degree directions where the order parameter actually goes to zero. In other words, where there really isn't any superconductivity in those directions. Now this was a hotly contested debate for, I don't know, three or four or five years, sort of in the early 90s. And there were advocates on all different sides, of, or both sides of this issue. The main advocate for S-wave symmetry was Nobel laureate and physicist at Princeton, Phil Anderson. Now Phil, in fact, is uh, well known to us. He was actually a graduate of Uni High in Urbana. Um, and he just thought his theories seemed to indicate to him it had to be S-wave. And there were lots of advocates of D-wave as well, but the leading one by far was our own colleague, David Pines. And there was a time when David would stop in your office pretty much every day and give you the scorecard of what it looked like, S versus D, what experiments were coming out in each direction. So before I talk about our experiments, let me answer a couple questions that you might be thinking. The first is, why do we care? Why is it important? And the reason we need to know the symmetry is, is the clue to the microscopic mechanism. What causes the pairing of superconduct, the uh, phenomenon of superconductivity? And I'll tell you right now, that is not a solved question. We do not know the answer to that. Uh, but the symmetry would be important in determining that. It's a key factor, as I've already said, in determining the properties. It's very, very important for applications, it turns out. The other question is, how do you do it? How do you find what the order parameter symmetry is? So here's what I call an experimentalist roadmap. You can write down the two states, and I've got graphs with uh, 20 more that we can look at. Uh, in the S-wave state, what that means is, as you can see here, the magnitude, if you, as you move around, these are angles, as you move around in different directions, the magnitude stays constant, the phase stays constant. It's a very uh, isotropic state. In the D-wave state, both the magnitude varies and the phase changes sign. It jumps from what we would say zero to pi in phase, which means a sign change in different directions. Now, it would seem that the magnitude would be obvious, but it turns out that things like impurities make it very, very difficult from magnitude measurements alone to learn anything about the pairing symmetry. And many experiments had been interpreted and argued back and forth. The, quest, the point is simply that things go wrong when you're trying to make this distinction. So we looked at the relative phase. We wanted to find an unambiguous signature. We thought this sign change was something that would be very clear. And we realized we could measure this by looking at interference. So this, in a way, is where my part of the story really starts. And uh, I did not do this alone. So just like Don Quixote had his sidekick, Sancho Panza, I had my own Sancho Panzas. I had uh, three of them. <laughs> so Tony Leggett. Don Ginsberg and David Woolman. And they went with me on this very exciting journey to try to figure out the symmetry of the order parameter in the high temperature superconductors. So here how, here's how it worked. Tony came up with the idea. Now, Tony's had lots of ideas. I pretty much made a career out of listening to Tony's ideas, and he's had good ones. But this, I think, was the best. And uh, I'm happy that he shared it with me. Or actually, in fact, he didn't. Because when he got the idea, he told David Pines. I'm not sure exactly what he thought David was going to do with that information. But uh, uh, David told Don Ginsberg, who told me back in the time when I actually had dark hair. And uh, what ensued then is what always happens in the lab. A lot of discussions. This was in December of 1991. So we tried to figure out how could we measure this? Could we use squids? How are we going to do this? And we came up with an idea, which I presented for the first time at my group meeting in January of 1992. And here's how it worked. It's actually a very, very simple experiment, and actually, I think, quite beautiful in its simplicity and elegance. You start with the crystal you're trying to study, and you put two Josephson junctions on each face, and you connect them through a loop of a conventional superconductor. So the role of Josephson junctions is that this tunneling process selects direction. Tunneling occurs, you want to go through the narrowest part, so the tunneling picks out the order parameter in this direction on this junction, in this direction, in this junction. Then you form a loop, which is just a squid. It's two junctions in a closed loop, as I've described to you, superconducting quantum interference device. You can measure, then, the phase shift between different directions inside the crystal using this device. So here's how it works. If you have an S-wave superconductor, the two junctions measure the same phase. 
If you then measure the critical current as a function of magnetic field, you find a periodic pattern, just like the two-slit pattern that I've talked about before. There is no phase shift in this system. The important thing is that zero magnetic flux, the critical current is a maximum. If it's D wave, and it says P wave, but it really should be D wave. Okay, so <laughs> that's, that's later in the talk. Okay, so uh, cross out P, put in D. Okay, so uh, if it's a D wave superconductor, this junction measures the plus lobe, positive lobe. This junction measures the negative load. There's a phase shift of pi. It shifts the entire pattern, and you get a minimum in the critical current at zero. This is equivalent to doing a two-slit optical interference experiment and putting something in here that shifts the wavelength or shifts the phase, shifts the, the, the uh, pattern by one half a wavelength or by a phase of pi. And you get this destructive interference right in the middle. So all you have to do is make a junction, a squid of this type, and you can tell from this pattern or this pattern whether it's S or D. Now we knew this was an amazingly beautiful experiment because very rarely in physics do you do an experiment that's going to tell you the answer. We knew if we could make this squid, we were going to know if it was S or D. We didn't know if Phil Anderson would be happy or David Pines would be happy, but we were going to know the answer. That doesn't happen very much. Usually you do an experiment, you get some data, you're not sure what you have, you do more experiments. This we knew was a really terrific idea. So then we went into the lab. And so here was what we wanted to make. We wanted to take the crystal. We wanted to make the corner squids. We wanted to make some squids just on the edge because this is a test just to make sure there wasn't anything going wrong. And we needed samples. Now David Pines had a, a, a statement he used to make many times which said there are three important things when you do high temperature experiments with high temperature superconductors. Samples, samples, and samples. Sounds familiar, but <laughs> um, so examples are incredibly important. It turned out we had the world's best single crystals of YBCO right down the hall. Because Don Ginsberg, uh, my colleague who unfortunately passed away a few years ago, was making at that time the most amazing single crystals, almost agreed by everyone to be the world's best. And here they are. And they are absolutely gorgeous. They have the sharp corners we needed to define the directions. They uh, have uh, very beautiful uniform properties. They are really remarkable samples. And he and his students had developed these over a number of years. Now, as I said, we knew this was a good experiment. I knew this was a good experiment. So I had a bunch of great graduate students, but I was going to do this experiment myself. This was my experiment. The only problem was, the only problem with Don Ginsberg samples is they were very small. In fact, if you look at the size scale here, this is 10 microns. To give you a, a size estimate, uh, a human hair is about 50 microns. So it's sort of like this. Here's an act, a picture of the actual size of the sample. I couldn't even see the samples, let alone put 10 different leads onto these crystals. So I had to get my students involved. And at this point entered the person who really made this work, one of my graduate students by the name of David Woolman who really became, in many ways, the hands and the eyes of this experiment. Now, this is a picture of Dave when I took him out to dinner after I won the Buckley Prize. It was a swanky restaurant in LA, and I think I'm still paying for that dinner. Um, <laughs> and here's Dave in his normal position in the laboratory. And what, uh, what David uh, figured out how to do was to actually mask these samples out, off, so he could, here's the crystal, some stuff on top of it. And then he could make these samples, which are here, and you can see here are the edge squids, and here's the corner squids, and it looks just like the picture. So Dave Woolman, who's now in fact the chief of the quantum electrical metrology division at NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology in Boulder, and in Gaithersburg, um, really pulled this off. Um, Dave went on to do a lot of remarkable things, and he is indeed one of the most intuitive and creative experimentalists I ever had the pleasure to work with. Okay, so we took the data, and here's our very, very first data. You can see it's just kind of hand-drawn in here with the scales, and this is pretty bad data. It looks like it was shot out of a gun, but you can see even with the low signal-noise ratio, there's definitely a periodic pattern here, and you can see there's a peak right in the middle. So let me re remind you what the answer is. If the, thing has a, if the, uh, the oscillation pattern has a peak at zero, it's S-wave. If it's a minimum, it's D-wave. This, we thought, was an S-wave superconductor. Now, Dave and I worked very well together. We didn't have many disagreements, uh, except we had one on this, because neither of us, we weren't really quite sure which one of us was going to go and tell David Pines <laughs> the bad news. 
But as often happens in the lab, things aren't as simple as you think at first glance, the data. And so we realized there was something going on with shifting of the patterns as a function of the currents we were using. This is a magnetic field effect, well understood now. And as we extrapolated the patterns to the lower fields, we realized, in fact, there was a dip in the critical current at zero. And we realized that this is indeed a D-wave superconductor. And many, many experiments then subsequently proved that you do get a phase shift of pi in the corner squids, don't get one in the edge squids. And we saw very, very clear evidence for this D-wave symmetry. Now, there are some problems here. There's a lot of spread in the data. That comes from magnetic flux, magnetic, uh, we call magnetic vortices that get trapped in the vicinity of the junction. So we decided to, or in, this, this, in the vicinity of the hole for the squid. So we decided to do a slightly different experiment where we got, where we got rid of the hole. And this is really uh, what we call the corner junction experiment. And basically it's the same experiment except it's done with a single junction that wraps around the corner of the crystal. In this, in this way, there is no way for magnetic flux to influence the answer. So if you have an S-wave superconductor, you should get this Fraunhofer pattern, big peak in the middle, if it's D-wave, again, because of the sign change in orthogonal directions, you should get a precipitous dip in the middle. Again, it's analogous to a single slit diffraction pattern, interference pattern for optics, where you cover half of the slit with a phase shifter. Here was the samples that David made, very, very beautiful corner junctions. And here was the result. And I think it's absolutely clear that this is a D-wave superconductor. Now, when this happens in your lab, it's very, very exciting. You know something that no one else in the world knows. We had the answer to this problem, and within a few weeks, we had propagated this to the world. And as Tony said, over a few years, everybody has sort of agreed on this result. So what's significant about this experiment? Well, first of all, we demonstrated the D-wave superconductivity, really the first confirmed unconventional superconductor. But I think even more than that, we pioneered this technique, which I'll mention in a moment, we're using to apply to lots of other candidates for unconventional superconductivity. In the future, there's lots of new physics. We don't know the, the mechanism, but we're working on that. And a couple things that happened, I think, just talk about the way physics works. It answered this key question. It was, I think, an elegant experiment. My thesis advisor was a guy named Jim Garland at Ohio State. And he always said, the highest compliment anybody can pay you in your lab is to walk in and say, that's a very elegant experiment. And even I have to agree that this was an elegant experiment. And I think it also involved a team concept in a very productive way. We had theorists, sample growers, measurers. Uh, and this is what we've now taken to, to really one of the highlights of our physics program, what we call the Urbana style, where experimentalists work together with, with theorists using good samples and good techniques to attack really difficult problems. So, that's the end of that part of the story. But it's not the whole end of the story, because from this point, things go in all different directions. We still don't know the mechanism of the high temperature superconductors. And there are a number of people who are working very hard at this. Down this road, if you take it, is an understanding of the phase diagram, an understanding of the mechanism, and probably another Nobel Prize for someone. The other direction you can take is applications. As I said, high temperature superconductivity has an amazing property of zero resistance and temperatures above liquid nitrogen temperatures. There's a lot of work being done to actually make power transmission lines. This is an example of one uh, by American Superconductor. You can see these cryogenic tubes going into the ground and carrying power. And this is actually likely to happen in our lifetime to try to cut down power dissipation. And I want to take this opportunity to advertise a talk for one of my colleagues. The floor is here tonight. Is she here? Uh, Laura Green is going to give a talk in the uh, Chancellor CAS lecture. That will be in this room on November 6th. We're going to make sure that everybody learns about superconductivity. So we're dominating the CAS lectures. Uh, my path was to continue to look at exotic superconductors, taking this pathway. Because once we found these D-wave superconductors, we actually learned there were a lot of other things out there. There are some heavy fermions called the 115 materials, things like cerium, cobalt, indium-5 have a fairly low TC, but are thought to be D-wave. They're organic superconductors, are thought to be D-wave, but anisotropic in magnitude. And then there are some very exotic materials. There are materials in which you have two phases, two different superconducting phases, one of which is real, one in which is complex. And I'll mention this in a moment, what I mean by that. And then this material that Tony mentioned, strontium or oxide, low TC, not interesting for applications, 
but in all of my career, the most exotic and amazing superconducting material I have ever had the pleasure of working with. We call this a chiral P-wave superconductor. In this material, it's not just plus and minus. The phase actually winds continuously around in this material. So we have taken to try to understand these kind of materials. And let me go back then to the interferometer picture. As we said, for S-wave, you can do a single slit pattern and look for this characteristic interference pattern. In the D-wave, we saw this pattern. What happens if it's a P-wave or chiral material? In this case, you get a type of uh, this chiral P-wave state breaks time reversal symmetry. That means there's a, it makes a difference whether this phase winds clockwise or counterclockwise. That causes an asymmetry in the polarity. In other words, when I measure the diffraction pattern in different directions or in, the, in our experiment, the critical current is a function of magnetic field, you can find that there's actually an asymmetry. It's different on this side than on this side. Characteristic signature of this complex time reversal symmetry breaking state. So um, we set out to look at these two materials. So here's some, uh, just a little bit of data on uranium platinum three. Again, we take crystals, we make junctions on this. And once again, this involved a very nice collaboration between a sample grower at Northwestern University, Bill Halperin, who provided these beautiful crystals, and one of my graduate students, Joel Strand. And you can see if you make junctions on the edge of the sample, in which the tunneling is certainly in one direction, you see something that's more or less this Fraunhofer pattern, nice peak in the middle, as you would expect. If you go into the corner so that half of the junction is on each edge, you can then see the similarity with this pattern. You get this asymmetric pattern. The peak is shifted away from the middle. You can see that we have evidence in this experiment for this broken time reversal symmetry, evidence for what we call a complex uh, order parameter. We call this a PX plus IPY state. It's just a complex uh, description of this material. So here again, we've used this very powerful technique of interference between the wave functions and the superconductor to learn something more about these materials. And this would be, if true, the first confirmed complex and P-wave superconductor that we've seen. We've also looked at this material, strontium ruthenium oxide, again, uh, involving a collaboration between a sample grower, Yoshi Mayeno in Kyoto in Japan, who made the crystals of strontium ruthenium oxide, and one of my former students, Francoise King-Wingira, who is now a postdoc at Stanford. This material is very complicated. What we find are really different things. The patterns do not reproduce. As you go back and forth, you get hysteresis, which means you get different things in different directions. We see very strange things like switching that occurs. So the sample will go up and switch back. A lot of jumps and wiggles and really strange things going on. And after a lot of experiments, we really have figured out, we think, what is going on in these materials. You have indeed a chiral superconductor. You have clockwise rotation of the order parameter, you have counterclockwise, and they form a distribution of these domains. We call these chiral domains. And so when you do a tunneling experiment, the reason it's complicated is you're picking out the interference patterns by going into each one of these domains. And if these domain walls move, the patterns shift back and forth, and you get a lot of switching behavior in the samples. So everything sort of hangs together here. We did a fairly definitive test of this by actually looking at a single crystal on two different faces. In one direction, these domains align. You get something that looks like a Fraunhofer pattern as predicted by experiments. In other words, here you have the phases all aligned in this sample. On the other side, because the chirality all rotates in one direction in one domain and the opposite direction in the other, you get phase shifts of order pi, like you do in a D-wave superconductor. That gives rise to structure in the interference patterns. This is the theory. This is what we observe. Again, we have very, very strong evidence for complex superconductivity and for chiral domains. So why is this exciting to us? Well, first of all, again, for us, it's all about the physics. There's new physics here. There's exotic materials to be discovered. Uh, every day is an adventure in the lab. This is, in fact, for me, the culmination of a very long search for these materials. I've spent sort of a decade trying to find something which had a complex order parameter. We thought we've seen things many times. We thought we've had theories that predict things. This is the first time I am sure that this is, in fact, a chiral superconductor. It's important for funding. This uh, issue of uh, order parameter symmetry and complex materials nanoscale science is important for our DOE quantum materials of a nanoscale cluster. 
Uh, it's something that many of us are working on. We're very excited to have these materials and have the support of the Department of Energy for this work and other opportunities, perhaps, for getting other funding. But perhaps the most important thing is this is potentially will enable a new direction for computing technology or information technology. And this has to do with a type of quantum, quantum computing which is called topologically protected. In ordinary quantum computing, you use a device, a two-level system like a squid device, and you have to apply some kind of a gate over some period of time to change the orientation of your phases and to do the operations to do computing. Errors come into those kind of processes. In this system, because of the, com the chiral order parameter, if indeed this is this uh, complex superconductor that we think is happening, there's a possibility of forming excitations, which in our case are vortices, which uh, have what is known as a non-abelian statistics. That means that it, the order of the operation depends on how, the, the, what the result depends on the order of the operations. The important thing here is not the details, but this protects you against any kind of detrimental effects. And so you can make a quantum computer that doesn't need error correction and, and has, I think, many people believe, the opportunity to make a real scalable quantum computer. There's uh, only two systems known to have this property. One is a quantum hall state, and in fact, Microsoft is pouring, the computer company is pouring lots of money into something that, which they call station Q, Q standing for quantum, to study the possibility of this kind of quantum computing. And the other one of these chiral superconductors, which actually is forming a big part of our research in the Department of Physics now. And in fact, I'll make another advertisement for the first workshop, I think, sponsored by the Institute for Condensed Matter Theory, I should say here, a workshop on topological phases. This is an exciting topic that many of us are working on. Okay, so this is in some ways the end of my story. A story with lots of history, scattered with Nobel Prizes, scattered with interesting science, and a lot of fun. So what have we learned from this? Well, I guess in the end, I think, I have learned that physics is indeed very much like wine. Because wine is really meant to be shared. So when my wife and I go on vacation these days, we like to go to wine country. It's very beautiful. We like to go and visit the wineries and sample the wine. And we like to uh, enjoy ourselves. And we look for really good wines like this very remarkable wine we found at Rodney Strong in the Alexander Valley, which I actually love the name, and actually the wine's pretty good too, with the name of Cemetery. So when you go to these wine shops, if you haven't, you, a lot of times they have little stores and they sell things. And one thing we've seen many times is a sign. And the sign says something about, it's not about the wine, it's about the people. I think it's about the wine too, but it's certainly also about the, the people. So I think physics is very much like this. Because in physics, I don't think it's really about the result or about the discovery. It's about the journey. It's about the quest to discover things in the laboratory and work with people doing that. So in my career, I have really had the pleasure of working with, in my quest, very, very many people. Way too many to mention, uh, to list, to show, to acknowledge properly. My research group, which has now consisted over the years of about 30 students and postdocs, including my present students, uh, my colleagues at the University of Illinois, who really make this the center of the universe in superconductivity. I don't think you can even, unless you go travel internationally, you do not realize the high esteem with which Urbana is held in superconductivity. This is the mecca of superconductivity. My mentors, my collaborators, my competitors even, all around the world who I see at conferences and interact with on these problems. My friends and family who are some are here tonight who have really supported me on this trip. And now all of you who have shared this experience with me. So thank you for going on this journey. And uh, again, I would like to uh, thank you for sharing this with me and hopefully we can also share some wine. Thank you very much. So I've been asked to offer that we have a choice. We can go drink wine or we can a answer some questions. And I would be happy to do either. <laughs> Anyone have any questions? Anybody want to drink wine? <laughs> what do you think, Tony? I think we're drinking wine. Thank you.